far and and I'm a businessman. Yeah. And I look forward to new challenges. Thank you. Mm. Oh, I just switched on the recording because I just remembered I'd forgotten to turn it off on, uh, which I'm a terrible at doing. Okay. Well, um, one of the things that I, I really wanted to um, talk about some of the stuff a few weeks ago uh, around Angela's proposal in particular um, and around digital identity and stuff like that that uh, you've got up there, Angela. And I was hoping to do that a couple of weeks ago with the previous Eastern Town Hall. But I thought, well, let's, since we're all here now and stuff, and I, I was wondering, do you want to give a rundown of that proposal in particular? And then um, I'd be quite interested to discuss generally in this room tonight, tonight unless it, um, this is my suggestion. So please uh, uh, um, come up with anything else that you would like to discuss. But I was hoping to sort of discuss a little bit more about digital identity more broadly and, and what it is and what it means. Um, okay. Yeah. Robert, uh, maybe you could give us some uh, short informations. Uh, when will the next fund nine will start? And then when will the fund eight uh, funds will be distributed? Or I mean, the transitions between fund eight and fund nine, that would be a great info for the people in here. Okay. Yeah. Anything else that uh, someone would like to go over? Um, I think maybe um, more of an overview of what this is all about. I think for the sake of uh, Hassan and for Jackie as well, she um, just a bit of an orientation of what um, what it's all about and what the kind of a process people go through and how people plug into this. I don't know whether those are too many questions, but I just feel like an overview and then mm the idea that people write proposals and what are these proposals and what is it about, just so that it can be a bit clearer to, to people who are not necessarily very familiar with the Catalyst community. Okay. Yep. Maybe Robert could give some introductions to Eastern Town Hall. What is Eastern Town Hall? Yeah. Andreas, can I ask you to just bring Kelly in here? Already. Please. I already put a sign here. Perfect. Okay. Kelly's coming in. So an overview of the Eastern Town Hall as well. Um, maybe Angela, would you like to give a sort of run through of um, an overview of what, what um, Catalyst is, and then we'll go into what uh, Eastern Town Hall is, and then we'll do the Fund 8, Fund 9 sort of timeframes, and then we'll get into uh, digital identity. So how does that sound as a sort of run through of doing everything? Yeah. Okay. Sounds good. Uh, Wait, am I am I talking about? <laughs> yeah, give it give it an overview of of what what we're doing here, what um, Cardano is, what a blockchain is, what Catalyst is. Uh, just an yeah. overview, and um, then you obviously delve down a little bit for Hassan and Jackie uh, into what uh, the mecha mechanisms and the machinery of Catalyst. So. Hi, my name is Angela. Um, I have actually been involved um, in this space for a year now, or in a few days, it'll be a year. And it's actually very interesting to look back and, and sort of think, <laughs> how would I define everything? It's a good question, Robert. And uh, so what is Cardano? Um, Cardano is a company uh, on the blockchain. Um, who, okay, so hmm, what is blockchain? <laughs> uh, are we going that far or zoom it in? <laughs> no, I just uh, explain what is uh, Catalyst and what we do here okay. in Eastern Town Hall. So, Project Catalyst is all about, as I'm sure you saw in the previous slides, it's an experiment to, see, uh, to explore the highest potential of human collaboration and what could possibly happen if uh, different people with uh, different experiences from around the world 
got together and decided to tackle uh, some, some of the biggest challenges that we all face from wherever we're coming from. Um, Eastern Town Hall is a part of Project Catalyst that's based on the Eastern Hemisphere, uh, mainly the countries of Japan, Indonesia, where Andreas and Jan, and Jan are from, right? And uh, Japan, Indonesia, Vietnam, uh, New Zealand, Australia, um, Philippines. Philippines is new. Yay! <laughs> we have a new uh, uh, group, actually. So, and East Africa. So, we are here to attempt to collaborate to the best of our abilities so that we can see how we can solve our problems with the blockchain idea. Um, should I uh, talk more about my proposal yet or just a grand overview? Uh, of just, to, uh, just, just to the overview and we'll, um, we've got to, we'll go into the overview. I'll cover fund eight, fund nine stuff uh, and then what the Eastern Town Hall is. So just okay. an overview of Catalyst itself, how it works. So Catalyst is what I would call a big collection of <laughs> big brains. And, and uh, there's all sorts of people, there's people with different experience levels. And uh, Western Town Hall, or the original Town Hall <laughs> that meets on Wednesday at 6 p.m. UTC, um, mostly deals with the issues from quite a few Western countries. And so Eastern Town Hall is right now, and it deals more with uh, the issues in the Eastern countries. There are other town halls. There's Africa Town Hall, uh, Fridays at some time, 8 p.m. I'm not sure what it is in UTC. Uh, the specific town hall for the people in the Pacific Isles. I'm actually not sure how that's going. I know Joe's a part of that, Robert. Um, and there's one more I'm missing. Uh, Latin America. Latin. Latin America Town Hall. Um, Thursday? Yeah, that's it. Yeah. So uh, we have been graciously accepted by the Eastern Hemisphere <laughs> and people of the East because we're in Eastern Africa. And we're here to meet and see how with um, not just the people, but the, the technology what we can make happen and how we can uh, change the issues that we have seen come up in the past uh, the past few years that, and see if we can make a difference in the future and see if we can make a difference, not just through technology, but through um, our countries and our systems and our governance. Um, does anyone have any questions? Any, so any questions at all in terms of what Angela's just explained and and how um, in terms of what Catalyst Carano is at all? No? So, so I can uh, keep going. Yeah, yeah. yeah, Jackie. Yeah. It's clear for me. It's clear. Cool. Mm -hmm. yeah. So Project Catalyst works is there's um, out of all of the currency that is called ADA, a portion of each transaction um, on the blockchain is put aside into something called the treasury. And the treasury, each um, what we call fund um, is given out to people who uh, propose for that money. Um, we are currently in fund, no, we've just concluded fund voting in fund eight and in each uh, fund we have different sections that uh, that we go through so there's the proposal week an editing week a second editing week a marking week where the CAs and the VCAs which are just people um, in the community mark the proposals and see how the proposals could be made better um, 
And then the proposal markers get marked by more proposal markers to make sure that everything is fair. That is the VCA is marking the CA, so that's another week. And then we have uh, 10 days of voting. And so that's what we are currently at the end of. And our next fund starts early June. Yeah. Cool. So, uh, so as the results come out, um, what happens is if you get funded, uh, then there's a whole other sort of step of processes and things like that that go into what is referred to as cat, um, catalyst coordinator, which is um, an, a way for reporting on what you're doing in terms of your activity, reporting back to the community in terms of what goes on. Now, in terms of all the categories and things that um, come through in Project Catalyst, the uh, community decides what categories proposals can go into. So in Fund 8, there was something like 20 different categories. And um, they cover things from community development, such as uh, what we're doing right here within uh, the Eastern Town Hall, which is trying to help people through the catalyst process and to actually try and understand how to put proposals together. To the more technical or very technical sort of um, areas, such as how do you make the underlying technology scalable? Uh, how do you build on top of it? How do you build um, applications or products on top of a blockchain? How do you uh, add to the developer experience? So it covers all of those sort of things. And um, indeed, there's even ones around nation building and legislation um, to, uh, areas. And each of these categories or challenges, as they're referred to as, uh, get developed by the community itself and also voted on. So we get to pick which challenges um, uh, happen in Fund 9 from voting on Fund 8. Uh, that is actually prob probably the most important uh, thing that you can vote on are the challenges because they start to uh, set the direction for the overall community and where it thinks it needs to go and, and what happens. Okay. Um, the challenges themselves just set out this category of funds that are available for proposers. So I think, for example, there was the open source developer ecosystem challenge that had an equivalent of 1.2 million US dollars. There was the nation building challenge, which has had an equivalent of 800,000 US dollars and so on. So you had a whole bunch of those. So when, um, when you get the results coming through uh, from the community vote, uh, you then go into this catalyst coordinator and you are to report basically on your activities as a project team and how you're going and where you're going. And then in fund nine, there's all the uh, challenges that have been voted by the community, which you can then think about how to put proposals in and what proposals are. And that's a big reason why we exist as in the Eastern Town Hall, which is to try and help you put your own proposals in and develop them and gain the experience, not only to um, how to write proposals and how to um, promote them and uh, think about them, those sort of things, but also uh, to help you learn and understand a little bit about what Cardano is as a blockchain, um, and also to help uh, work through how you might map a, um, this underlying technology to your problem that you've identified. And uh, then also just help to promote uh, your proposals and in order for voters to actually understand them. There's also the idea of being a, a community advisor and a veteran community advisor. These are self-appointed roles, or at least the community advisor is, uh, that enables you to go in and review proposals. And 
if there's probably one thing to do before you even do your own proposal is to actually be a community advisor because you start to learn a whole lot about um, what's expected in the community. You will actually start to pick up commonality in terms of what's going on um, and how to prepare a proposal in your own right. So these are the sort of things that um, you can go through and learn. And you should not expect, although yeah, it's not, uh, um, it does happen, but don't expect your proposal to be uh, voted um, immediately as in, in the, the round that you, the funding round that you put it in. There's nothing stopping you from preparing it, getting all the feedback from the community advisors, and then putting it up in the, in the subsequent fund. So you might put up a fund in fund nine coming up, which is the next round coming up, but it may not be successful. But you've actually received a whole lot of um, comment and experience actually doing a proposal that you can refine it even more so for fund 10 and put it up and carry on that way. And you learn yourself how to improve what you do, how to adjust the message, how to adjust the words in the proposal, how to think about it better, those sort of things. It gives you space and time, okay? Um, the, typically what's happened in the past uh, between funds is the results come out and we dive straight into the next round of funding. Uh, but what's happening this time around is there's actually a little quiet period for a couple of weeks. Thank goodness. <laughs> uh, because it can actually be really exhausting. Uh, the, uh, originally, there was actually parallel run, uh, funds going, they were overlapping each other, and the fund four and five and six. And I think at the end of fund six, uh, I, all of us in the Eastern Town Hall, I think we're feeling absolutely shattered. Uh, it was just absolutely exhausting. We had to try and grab our breath because we'd also won uh, been funded for um, a number of proposals. And it was sort of like, oh, shoot, we're exhausted. We've been so busy. Uh, now what? Oh, we've got to try and deliver. Um, so by giving a sort of space in between, uh, that gives us a time to uh, contemplate and reflect uh, and see what's happening. But also, uh, there's an important part of it. We've done all these funds. There's, the community's growing quite substantially. But also, um, but not necessarily the processes behind it have developed at the same rate. There's, because it's actually rather difficult to figure out how to fund a community that is spread all over the world, right? Trying to figure out this new technology, this new space, new ways of exploring things, and trying to work out how to do that together in a collective, uh, collaborative fashion. That's actually quite a lot, a heck of a lot. Uh, and uh, we're all coming with different viewpoints, different uh, experiences, local, different local conditions. Um, and so, yeah, there, uh, uh, there's a lot to learn and we can't underestimate how much there is. So part of the reason to have a little break in between the two funds um, at this point in time is to give a bit of an opportunity to actually improve the processes and that thinking behind what's going on. Uh, foremost, even though we're here for um, a blockchain initially, foremost what you'll find is it's actually about the people. Yeah, and where I'm from is a little phrase uh, from Māori, uh, a Māori phrase, which goes, he tangata, he tangata, he tangata, which basically means it's the people, it's the people, and it's the people. Yeah. And that's what we're doing here at um, the Eastern Town Hall, is to try and basically help people fulfill, as Angela has said, the highest potential of human collaboration. And if anything, that's what we're doing, trying to do here. Okay, any questions? None. Come on. I've got six coffees in me. Well, no, eight coffees in me. Come on. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Maybe a question uh, to people who just joined. Uh, how many weeks or how many days is the transitions now? 
uh, the the time between fun eight and fun nine. No idea. Two, two weeks. Yeah, two weeks. Behind. Thanks, Angela. Yeah. Um. So, you know, I, I, I think they use the agility model. It's a scrum. It's like a scrum agility sort of the, the type of management that IHK is employing is what we call in management agility. So agile management where it's a scrum and you have these sprints every week, sprints, weekly sprints. And one of the big questions that's coming out now is uh, the mental health of the people doing agility scrums because uh, they are supposed to be improving um, companies' um, efficiency and agility, but they are also having an effect on, on people's mental health. So I think, Andreas, the question you're asking is, is it's getting less and less clearer what is the next thing because I think it's an experiment and there needs to be these breathers, little breathing spaces between the the scrum, the, between right. the, the sprints, within the, the scrum. sprints, yeah. yeah. Yeah, within the scrum. So I think that's what's going on. And so as an as an experiment, I think it's good when we get these little 10 day breathers. And, mm -hmm. But it also makes us unsure of what is happening next, because it's, it's, I think it's a balancing act. And I don't know, maybe one day we will get it. One day, we, maybe it will even itself out and get into a rhythm. But right now, it's still quite up in the air, I think. It, it's quite there's a lot going to actually change the way in which people work and try and get things done. There's actually a heck of a lot to it because you what you just touched on there and is something that I'm thinking through a lot at the moment about on a number of different things. There's this trade-off between always being task focused. Du -du -du -du. You've got to get this done, got to get this done versus um, you know, giving people space to, if you're always totally task focused, you don't have, um, it's exhausting basically because you don't actually have any time to um, step back, look around and do things because the stepping back and looking around sort of isn't a task per se. And then it's also the, the other component is you don't have enough time for everyone else, you know, to dive in and things. Um, and within the Catalyst ecosystem, there's so much going on. Angela's just listed out all the different uh, community town halls, the Latin America, the Pacific, the um, Eastern Town Hall, the main town hall, those things. Uh, but there's also a whole lot of other sort of community groups that are popping up left, right and centre uh, that are focused on things like the climate change, probably, you know, uh, Kadano for climate. There's the NFT gamers, there's the stake pool operators. Um, Andreas is part of the ambassador program. Uh, there's all the developer programs going on. There's you know the Plutus Pioneer programs, the Atala Pro, um, Prism Pioneers program, and now there's the Marlow Pioneers program. Um, and I know for myself personally, I was getting absolutely exhausted trying to <laughs> attend all of those things. Yeah. It's just way, and then you've got all the meetings with the coordinator and stuff like that. Um, and so I've had to sort of step back from a lot of the sort of group discussions, even though I'd like to attend a lot more and set a hard rule that if it happens before um, 7 a.m. in the morning, I'm not attending it <laughs> because often I'll have meetings going through to about 12 o'clock at night because you're working with people around, around the world. And so somewhere I've got to have a little bit of a break every now and then on that front. So yeah, it's hard and in a good way, in a good way, hard in a good way. <laughs> anyway, um, so are there any sort of comments, um, Hassan or Jackie or Kelly, that you would like to uh, ask uh, questions from what's been discussed so far? Yeah, I have a question. Yeah. Uh, I'm, I'm new to, to this platform. I'm new to this community. 
I'd like to know uh, where do I start from? Uh, my background is I'm a developer and a business person. Now I'd like to know where do I start from? What is the mode of facilitation? Uh, uh, what are the targets that I need to meet? What, uh, what is the team's vision or the company vision, mission, objective? I need to have a head start to that. Thank you. Okay, well, I might take that last question and then Andreas, you might, if you could pick up around the developer um, work. But the last one is who sets the objective? What is the objectives and stuff like that? You know, what and direction and things like that. Actually, that's us. That's our job. That's our job as members of the community. That's the whole point. It's not a company that is owned by uh, shareholders that are distant and remote. If you uh, hold ADA indirectly, you own a share in the ecosystem and the well-being of the, um, the Cardano ecosystem. And you can obviously um, also, well, not obviously, you can earn ADA through your participation in Catalyst. Uh, so Catalyst itself funds um, for the CA community advisor phase, the veteran community advisors. Uh, you get uh, funded for helping people propose. You get, sorry, you get paid or compensated. Um, and you get compensated for voting. So there's a number of ways in which you can actually earn ADA as well as ADA from um, putting in proposals. So how we set an objective is actually defined more or less through the challenges that I mentioned earlier. The challenge settings is the first and foremost starting point. Then all the proposals that go up into Catalyst and then the people that vote on it. So the community members that vote on those proposals helps set the direction. And that direction is emergent. There's no specific overriding um, objective because we're still too early uh, in terms of trying to establish that. If there is one objective is defined by the uh, Charles Hoskinson's vision, which is a notion of economic identity um, and the so-called financial operating system of the world, so to speak. Uh, those two data points, terms or concepts. We can take those and then we can try and figure out what that actually means for us. But ultimately it's up to us to set the objective and direction. So Andreas, do you wanna chat about uh, where to go for developers? Yep. Uh, that sort of thing? Okay, hi Hassan, thanks for the great questions. So in the chat, I already mm. put several links for you. Mm. First, uh, you mm. as a developer, you can check the Cardano developer portal. You will have oh, several okay. resources there. Uh, there's uh, some library uh, like Java, JavaScript, um, or ha uh, mm. Haskell, Pl Plutus for the, our smart contract. And then mm. um, for the funding itself, if you want to build some applications, uh, the apps in Cardano, using a smart contact like Pluto's, um, you can check out the website, cardano.idscale.com. Uh, usually all of the Catalyst fund, uh, one fund usually is around three months, starting from this proposal submissions. Uh, you need to refine your proposals again based on the feedback. And then after that, uh, the Catal uh, community advisors and veteran community advisors will check, uh, will give, uh, how do you say? give assessment to your proposals. And based on that, there will be some ratings for your proposals that will go into the mobile apps, uh, Catalyst Voting apps, where the uh, ADA holder, the people who has the ADA uh, token or coin called votes on your proposals. So basically, each challenges has uh, the maximum cap of their uh, the fund, for example, in, uh, I don't know, um, in one of the category challenges, for example, like uh, if you want to develop a DApps, a DApps, uh, like mm -hmm. 500,000 US dollar. So usually it's like from the number one proposals that gets the most voting will be funded first. And then uh, up until the fund is uh, 
already uh, divided into all of, all of the proposals that are in the top list, something like that. So yeah, if uh, and this Eastern Town Hall is helping you to uh, build or, or to help you to submit proposals to build uh, good proposals and how you can cam do campaign and so on. So yeah, if you have a questions, uh, please do ask. We will try to answer your questions. Hassan, is there any particular, um, you know, so you're a, a software developer, so are there particular tools that you're familiar with and use? Yeah, I, I, I use uh, PHP hmm. primarily. I use, I'm very familiar with JavaScript, uh, web uh, server, client technologies, MySQL, uh, SQL Server, um, uh, db.net, C. Yeah, I'm familiar with those languages. Okay. And um, have you done anything with blockchains before? Or are you familiar with the, the concept of what the technology is? Or are you quite new to it, that as well? I haven't, uh, haven't developed anything using blockchain, but I've been transacting, uh, making uh, electronic transactions that have been uh, built on blockchain end to end encryption. So I'd like to, to have this challenge where I can develop uh, apps that are running on this. Okay. Um, mm -hmm. So one of the ones, things that you might want to have a look at is things like the uh, Block Frost API and to get yourself going on that. Um, I'm okay. not familiar, there's a few of the JavaScript frameworks I'm not that familiar with in terms of I don't know what's out there. Um, but certainly have a look at the Block Frost API. Uh, I might, put the documentations in the chat. Yeah. And that, that gives you a uh, JavaScript sort of friendly web uh, API into the underlying Cardano blockchain. So you can start to build applications and things like that on top of it. Are there any, um, Jackie and Hassan, is there any sort of areas that of problem areas that um, you are particularly interested in trying to solve or address? Well, personally, um, I'm, I'm new to the platform and uh, I'm excited about learning. And I'm this kind of person who doesn't keep good things to herself. So I've already started looking into my network to see people who can really bring value to the platform and to the benefit of the community. So that is where I'm at now. Okay, great. So basically in uh, here in Catalyst also, there are lots of uh, category or there are lots of people who submit proposals to, for example, if you like education, you can create a, you can learn first Cardano and then you can create a workshops to spread a Cardano to people in your local community. So yeah, you can submit proposals for that also. That would be great. And Angela here has a lot of experience on that too. Yeah. All right. Thank and you. Hassan, is there any particular area, problem area that uh, you are interested in? Uh, one other area I'm interested in is uh, education, uh, where I'd like to incorporate uh, uh, training, uh, technological training into mainstream learning, like in the rural areas, deep down in the countryside. Countryside, yes. I, I'm, I'm, I'm really motivated and it's my dream to see people have access to such technologies. And apart from that, uh, I, I, it's also my dream to have an outreach program where people have uh, access to energy, clean, safe energy. Yeah, something like that. I don't know whether it fits the puzzle of Cardano. Uh, both do, yeah, both, both very much do. Uh, Kelly, I was, I was wondering if um, you wanted to introduce yourself a little bit and uh, I also asked, 
sort of ask you what question uh, problems uh, interest you. Um, sure. Can you all hear me? Yeah. Yeah. Hey. So yes. Um, uh, so my name is Kelly, and uh, I've been in Cardano for a while. I, I think uh, from late or uh, mid 2019. Um, uh, I've been mostly uh, in terms of uh, investing and uh, that kind of thing, but, but also active in the community in regards to trying to learn the technology. Um, I've done a bit of Plutus. I stopped midway the Plutus Pioneer program. Um, I stopped so that I could uh, try to focus on learning Haskell first. So progressing with that and uh, hoping that uh, I'll get to complete uh, uh, the Plutus program at my own pace. Um, so I've also been active uh, for a while in Catalyst, but not this active, uh, mostly doing voting. I think I started voting from fund five, I'm not sure, but on and off. Um, I guess I, at some point I spread myself within in Cardano. Um, I ran a stake pool, I think the shortest lived stake pool, it ran for three months and I shut it down. So um, uh, through and I was able to, uh, we met at some forum and I was able to uh, talk to her and uh, realize we're in the same uh, uh, community. And uh, so I'm now hoping to be more active in Catalyst. Um, so that said, um, I have probably two major questions. Um, so I'm working on an, a mobile app um, that allows, uh, would allow Kenyans primarily to buy Cardano through M-Pesa by making a payment to a pay bill. So one of the things I'm not too sure about is if I was to try and get funding to Catalyst, um, given the objectives from what, what it seems to me that they are funding would, is primarily driven by community goals rather than profit making goals. Uh, so I'm not sure whether that is accurate and uh, I don't want comment on that on what is the probability of such a proposal going through for that kind of an app, which is for my primarily profit making. Um, the other question is uh, on community advisors. I am wondering if they are, to what extent I'd be engaging with the community members. For instance, are there people who would be able to help me go around um, issues with regulation? Like right now, um, the, the particular app I'm working on, I'm not too sure whether um, I'll meet a blocker in the sense that uh, we don't have regulation here. So I don't know if I'll be able to get an investor to be an account. Uh, so maybe I do want to get general comments on those two points. Uh, yeah, yeah, thanks. Um, so being profit seeking company, doing something on top of, on top of Cardano is, and being founded by Catalyst is perfectly acceptable. Um, in fact, in Fund8, there were two distinct developer ecosystem challenges uh, that one was saying, which was the open source developer ecosystem, which is essentially saying, right, you're doing something here, but you plan to make it open source. And the other one was, you're a developer ecosystem, you're doing something, but you can't make it open source. So there was a distinction just along those two lines because you wanted to keep it commercially uh, for commercial purposes. So there's absolutely nothing to stop you um, in the community that says that you can't be for profit. Um, you can just think of basically the Cardano Catalyst project grants and they are grants as a way to seed that sort of work. Um, on to, in terms of uh, uh, the problem that you've identified, which is you know, how do you integrate with M-Pesa uh, into mobile apps to cross over in terms of um, payments, uh, that would be something that would be very attractive to a common challenge, which is the uh, um, D-apps and integration sort of challenge, which often um, comes up in all the, all the funds that are going through and would be something that a lot of 
people within the community would think is a really, really good idea because essentially they want to be able to connect the Cardano blockchain into a real world, real, real world situations. Um, so uh, integrating with M-Pesa would be a, seen as a key way of doing that. Um, in terms of uh, regulation and information you'll get from the CAs, the CAs aren't there to do that per se. They're there to assess the proposals uh, based on the criteria. They're given three criteria, which is how aligned is the proposal to a given challenge? Um, how uh, feasible is the proposal? And uh, how auditable, you know, how, how can we monitor it? Is it clearly able to monitor it? That's largely the remit of the CAs. They can't go in and give advice per se. They might have an opinion about saying, this is not feasible because of X, Y, Z, uh, but generally they won't uh, do that. What is intended, uh, what replaces that or gets closer to what you're asking to be done is the way Catalyst is structured, the Catalyst process. Um, we go through several different phases in the Catalyst process. The first one is ideation, which is throw up um, an insight. Um, so for example, the insight here would be that uh, M-Pesa is widely deployed in Kenya uh, and is very successful. We need to integrate with it. Uh, and that would give us yeah. great access. That, that's the sort of insight phase. Um, and the idea behind the insight phase is just to put put an idea out there, not to put a proposal out, but rather to just signal to everyone in the community, this is what I'm interested in looking at. Then you go through the proposal writing stage, which goes through um, multiple weeks. Uh, and the idea there is to solicit feedback and comment from people in the community. So that is where you'll get people that might show up and come across your proposal and say, well, hey, actually I've had experience doing this in, in Tanzania. I've had, I've had experience doing this in, um, uh, in Indonesia. And these were the issues that we found, right? How to approach uh, the regulation component. Uh, the other alternative is that often, um, there is a challenge for proposals that deals specifically with regulation and how do you actually um, you know, talk to legislators and those sort of things. So if one of um, you know, the first thing that you've identified, you can go off and do um, the MPESA integration, fine, right? Technically we'll go off and build it, uh, but you don't know about the regulation, which will, you know, uh, cause all sorts of problems if the regulators don't like what you're doing. Uh, then possibly the best way to do it is to put up a proposal, first of all, to investigate that very question. How do I talk with regulators? And uh, where do I get those sort of issues coming through and discussed from that point of view? Okay. So does that uh, sort of, help you out there, Kelly? Um, yeah, uh, thanks, Robert. That's, that's quite uh, helpful. So from, I guess from your feedback, what I'm getting that potentially uh, I have the opportunity to do uh, uh, probably three uh, proposals. One around uh, maybe the, the regulation bit, trying to investigate that and uh, have a solution. Um, the other one, uh, probably around an uh, a proposal that would fall under the integrations uh, uh, ch challenge or category. And that we now the active project that I'm working on. Uh, I'm just trying to see if is that accurate in regards to how I could approach it uh, going forward. Yeah, that is that is generally it. That's um, oh. you've, you, we do have to wait to see what the challenges come through uh, first and oh. foremost. But you can, if you've already voted uh, in fund eight, you would have gone into the fund eight challenge settings, and you can see what types of challenges have been proposed. 
Um, oh. Angela has put into the uh, chat there a link around all the blockchain regulations and laws um, that you might want to look at as well. But then, I also yeah. I put in a list of um, ten proposals that the Cardano Foundation has uh, backed. So you're probably pretty assured that those are going to go through. Mm -hmm. One being one your your you you have a medical um, an, an interest in the medical one, so that medical one might go through. Um, so you can start to plan ahead for that. That's good. And uh, Hasanos, uh, just for you to have a look at, um, to get an idea um, of what sort of proposals, go and have a look at the uh, Project Catalyst Voter Tool. I've just put a link in there. Uh, and just type in words like learning or education or teaching. And you might see proposals. Um, I've just put in the word learning there. Um, to do a search on it. And you'll see all the sort of different proposals from Fund 6, Fund 7, Fund 8 that have been put up for uh, learning related type of activities, projects. So you might be interested in that. Um, there's often things around uh, learner credentials, how to do, uh, you know, recognize, um, certifications, those sort of things from a learning outcome point of view. There's uh, putting together learning programs of different types. So Gimbal Lab does quite a bit of, of project-based learning sort of activities. Uh, and likewise, I haven't done a look, but let's have a look for power. You'll probably also find um, things on how to do uh, electricity power generation. There's not that many, but... Um, uh, going through. But that's one place to start. Treat the um, Catalyst proposals themselves as a learning resource for your own interest and for your own help by going through past proposals. Some will be funded, some won't. Uh, you yourself will pick up a lot of the language, get ideas that you can follow through and try and understand from those two sort of areas that interest you on that. Uh, front. So, uh, yeah, any other sort of questions uh, that anyone's got on that? No? Okay. Um, what I was think would be interested, but um, if you don't want to do this, but let me know, uh, is to dive into um, digital identity uh, using um, Angela's proposal that she has up on fund um, eight, uh, which is to do with the coffee supply chain. And obviously I've got coffee on my mind at the moment. So uh, <laughs> that's why, you know, I'm thinking about it. That's why I had six shots or whatever it was of coffee I've had today, Angela, because, yeah, <laughs> had to prepare for what I was doing. Um, so Angela's put the link to her proposal in there. And I was just wondering if, yeah, we can do two things here. Uh, by looking at one particular proposal, uh, we can go through and learn a bit about how to put together a proposal itself. Uh, it's a bit on a topic which um, you know, is related to Tanzania, Uganda, Kenya, um, Democratic Republic, and the, uh, Ethiopia as well in terms of coffee growing regions. And it's also touching on um, the idea of digital identity or specifically something known as self-sovereign identity. But with that, um, Angela, how would, uh, would you like to give us an overview of your proposal and what your thinking was behind it and how it came to be, that sort of thing? Sure. Um, if I may just briefly explain self-sovereign identity, just quickly. Um, probably not very well, but. <laughs> so we have a system where, for example, if you would like a Gmail account, um, Gmail gives you the key and then Gmail is able to keep all of your information with them. And you have a password and your password is able to 
uh, open that account with all of the emails you receive and whatever. Um, the downside is they are able to track you, they're able to watch you, they're able to collect data on you, um, and you don't get a say as to what they do with it with that data. As you know, uh, Yahoo was hacked, <laughs> uh, and I don't know how many accounts were were hacked in that system. So there's an issue with that. And the way we're moving forward, not just from that particular identity, well, let me backtrack. It's the same thing with governments, right? Your government gives you an ID. And if you, like in Kenya, walk into a building, the guard will ask to see your ID. And then the guard knows exactly how old you are. The guard knows exactly <laughs> where you were born. They have all of your identity. They have your height. They have, okay, you're right there. But they get access to more information than you possibly would need to have access to a building or access to a bank account. Um, so there's an issue of privacy with that. And there's an issue of once a larger entity has your information, how do they then manage it? And how, what say do you have in deciding who gets to see the other parts of your identity? Uh, information. And so what would be better possibly is uh, for example, if you need to prove that you're over 18, that only that part of your identity, your identity, only that part would be uh, visible to the person trying to check on you. Um, and so that's what we're attempting <laughs> to do with Cardano. Cardano has a particular um, identity system called Atala Prism, and Atala Prism takes this on. And so self-sovereign identity is, if I was to conclude it very broadly, uh, a way to only give the information, a, a way for the verifier to only share the necessary information and not necessarily the rest of it. I don't know if that makes any sense. Um, so anyway, <laughs> I've, I've skipped over a whole bunch of information in that description, but hopefully that's clear-ish. Um, so my proposal, the SSI for Coffee in East Africa, is all about this issue that I've seen having grown up in Kenya, where a lot of uh, coffee farms that I used to be able to see just growing have shut down, have been turned into apartments, have been turned into, uh, they've kind of disappeared and there's no longer as much visible coffee. Um, another thing I've seen is that we do not drink local coffee. We drink coffee that is brewed externally and then we buy it back. We grow coffee and then we buy it really, 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 <laughs> really expensively from foreign companies, which is strange. Um, <laughs> and, the end result uh, is that East African coffee growers are poor and dis disenfranchised and sort of powerless. And so I've teamed up with Jackie. Jackie lives in Uganda. Jackie's um, experience with the coffee industry has been more that she and her father own uh, a coffee farm. And she's seen several things going on with this. She's seen, uh, the, the next generation or the youth are not as interested in growing coffee or learning how to. She's seen that uh, the system for uh, coffee, selling coffee and the, the market, the hmm, words. She has the coffee beans. She has been through a whole lot of drama to dry them and to make them um, sell already but she does not get a say when the middleman comes and uh, buys coffee at his price. And then he takes it to another middleman who takes it to another middleman who buys it in bulk where um, someone in a, uh, what's it called? Starbucks far, far away gets to buy really cheap coffee. Whereas, Jackie does not make much money from a situation like that. And so how can we put together self-sovereign identity and 
our, our particular situation, which I looked at from three particular countries, Tanzania, Kenya, and Uganda, and found slightly different problems in each. Um, so how can we get that to work better so that we uh, can restore purchasing power to the farmers? Um, that is what this proposal is all about. Uh, Robert, what do you... That's good. Uh, one, one of the things... Any questions? Uh, yeah, I, I um, before, before we dive into the, the problem space of, say, coffee and stuff, um, one of the things I will say about the self-sovereign identity focus here is actually it's applicable, the generalization is applicable to uh, education. It's important for power generation. Uh, identities also will be important, a topic for things like um, integration with MPESA, because in the case of uh, Kelly, in the case of the uh, regulation there, the biggest one is to, a uh, part of regulation there is all the uh, AML, uh, which is anti-money laundering, um, know your customer, KYC, and the counter-terrorism funding sort of regulations, which are largely the American financial system reaching out across the world um, and imposing these sort of restrictions, financial restrictions on people. Uh, so that's usually one of the biggest areas. And strong notions of identity are really important in that domain. But also one of the other areas where it's been picked up is in um, education. How do you know someone's got a uh, credential uh, you know, have gone through the learning exercises, has have attended the courses, the classroom sessions or whatever, have done the exercises, those sort of things. How do you know? Um, so this idea of identity, digital identity specifically, uh, crosses a whole lot of different domains. My question when you were talking, Angela, is um, you framed identity more or less as how much, what information is revealed to a verifier. But I was interested to know, um, because um, I'm from a tribal society here in New Zealand, which is Māori, and um, Uganda, you know, uh, East African countries also tribal. Uh, and uh, there's sort of from Indonesia as well, Jan and Andreas would be, I'm interested to know, reflecting upon um, your own culture, how is that identity actually defined? I, I can answer that in the Māori context, but I'd be interested to know how not digital identity or anything else like that, but generally what, from a cultural point of view, defines identity? And this might seem like a nebulous sort of thing, but I, I recall you being fascinated by the one of the readings from the Atala Prism thing, which is called the Patterns of Commoning. And uh, so that talks about things. So um, An Angela, do you want to have a go answering that? And Jackie, I'll call on you as well. Yeah. Um, well, it's very important which family you're from. Okay, so I'm from a particular tribe, <laughs> putting myself all the way out there. Forgive me, I'm not trying to be tribal. You ask, okay? So it's a delicate-ish situation because we're voting this year and it, it, it becomes complicated. Um, but in my particular tribe, uh, there are certain clans and you're one of the clans and within each of the clan, you know, uh, you're from a particular family. And so my name would be, uh, it's very similar to sort of a, you know how the Icelanders do David's son and David's daughter? Uh, do, you, do you know about the, <laughs> yeah, it's, it's a similar thing where you would say, I am Angela of my father's name of, of a particular clan, if you were introducing yourself to a tribal uh, setting. What do you guys think? 
Kelly, Jackie. Yeah, just to add to that, uh, basically, identification starts with the name. Because the name then ident gets, gets to your family, then the family kind of gives out the, the lineage. I'm a daughter to so-and-so, son of so-and-so. That is how we do it in Africa. Secondly, we are also identified by our values, what we eat, what we dress, what we say, what our language. So that is my understanding of identity. That when I come out in my traditional attire, you can easily say by my dressing, what I say and how I behave, you can easily know that, okay, she's a Muganda from Uganda. That's all I can say about identity. Yeah, do you want to um, chime in a little bit from an Indonesian perspective? Regarding what defines what it, identity, yeah. In the terms of my culture? Yep. Mm, it's somewhat close to, it's a mix of a lot of things. Uh, prior to myself, it, was it Kelly that, uh, that, that, uh, was it Kelly? Yeah. So Kelly mentioned name. So that's uh, that's also what um, is a part of what identifies myself that uh, comes from a certain culture. So my name is my complete name is Yano Tirta Harna, and Tirta uh, comes from uh, uh, the Sanskrit culture. So um, what defines um, Besides name, I will uh, also put in geographical position. Um, that um, that also defines what uh, we are. So when it uh, comes to like uh, what uh, about digital identity, it's really I think it's really complex um, because we have to consider lots of things, not just our name, but also where we live. And um, then there comes like the economic factor of things and so forth. So yeah, that's how I feel that um, uh, what, what in a simplistic way, what, uh, what um, defines I, uh, identity through, the, through uh, my experience. Okay, well, um... You would have said I've changed my background. I'll just move slightly off to the side there. Yeah. Um, that is in Māori culture, uh, in my particular, for my particular tribes. You know, I'm a member of several, um, but in this case, it's uh, Ngāti Rua Nui and Ngāti Rua Hine. Uh, that mountain, Mo'o Maonga, is our ancestor. It's our Tipuna, as we call it, and we all descend from that mountain. And in New Zealand's legal landscape, that mountain is a person. It's recognised as such in the legal system. Um, so, for example, if someone goes and does any sort of environmental damage on it, that's a criminal case against them. Right? So it's... Um, uh, and what we find within our culture is our identity stems from, it always starts in what is known as the whānau or the family. It goes up to what's called the hapu, which is the sub-tribe. Uh, then you've got something called the iwi, uh, which is the bigger tribe. And then you've got something called the rohi, which is the, group, the area from which you come. And the, uh, usually the area from which you come is defined by your primary um, ancestor, which is typically a mountain. Uh, and so uh, uh, the mountain that was on my previous background called Araraki is from another tribe called uh, um, uh, Ngāti Tohu um, from the South Island, whereas this is um, Taranaki. Okay, uh, so um, 
identity here as a tribal thing is comes is very dynamic. It's very fluid. Uh, it comes from this relationship between um, who you are like this, who your parents are, who your grandparents are, what river, uh, what um, mountain, and then what's known as what waka. Waka is a canoe um, that your your ancestors arrived on to this country. Uh, because New Zealand is, uh, was uninhabited by humans for a long, long time. Uh, we just had lots of birds, that was all. Um, hence why we have flightless birds all over the place. Um, and so that's, uh, and identity is constructed like uh, what Jackie was saying, in terms of you know, the way in which you participate within your culture. Uh, is largely how it's defined, okay? Now, the reason why I ask these questions is because um, identity is framed in two broad ways, depending on what your background is coming from. There's a Western notion of state government, which defines it by there's some sort of authority that defines who you are, whether you've gone through, got your education credentials, whether you're... Um, a citizen of Kenya or New Zealand or Indonesia, um, all those sort of things that are state defined, right? But in tribal societies or collective societies, it's relationally defined, defined by your participation and interaction over time. Okay. Um, and so that means that um, uh, this idea of identity can be very uh, nebulous, can be very vague, those sort of things. Uh, and But we have to be aware of the different approaches to it. Uh, because one of the things with the blockchain technology, it enables us to um, actually explore new ways of, or traditional ways of representing identity, rather than just the state of subscribed identity. Uh, um, we, throughout all the SSI work and stuff, the self-sovereign identity work, uh, despite having this notion of self-sovereign, which basically means that you have control over your credentials, your identity, it's actually still heavily anchored within the Western notion of identity. Right? Uh, because largely most systems, things like that in the past, didn't have any other way to do it. One of the things I think is that we can actually explore much richer notions of identity within a blockchain space. And that was a sort of one way to sort of anchor that for everyone. Um, so perhaps um, you're, is there any sort of questions around that? On that at all? Uh, so Angela, what I'm interested in, to, and Jackie, please answer this as well, is, um, the process of doing the proposal. What was your experience? How did you approach it? How did you think about it? Um, what struggles or what did you find difficult? Uh, you've got the CA reviews, those sort of things. What, what sort of things came through? Jackie, may I go first? Please do. Um, so, I was inspired from many, many different uh, sort of trains of thought. Um, I was very inspired by, I, I, I actually um, was really, really interested when, it, hmm, I came across it, I've just remembered when. <laughs> Sorry about my communication skills, I'm trying my best. Um, <laughs> uh, in the Cardano summit uh, last year, they showed the process of putting a particular wine um, industry in Georgia onto the blockchain. And I was like, ooh, that's interesting. Um, and then I was involved or researching or reading several things about coffee. And so the final thing that sparked 
um, the idea was actually being in Tanzania and listening to uh, an older gentleman really weep for his his uh, father's friends who had a lot of them died of a situation where they were brought pesticides, they put them all over their coffee, and then several uh, seasons later, a lot of them died from cancer. And he was just sort of bemoaning, not in a derogatory way, but like he was he was just processing this thought outwardly. Um, and, and, and I just went, you, you've got to do something about this. Because then I thought about, um, and so it's, it's sort of a complex thought that on a larger scale is trying to change at least one sector in East Africa that I've noticed has had an issue. Um, I was lucky enough to be introduced to Jackie. Uh, and Jackie, take it away. What, what's been your experience? First of all, I'm grateful to be on this platform. I remember the evening, uh, Anne called me and introduced this Cardano thing in a minute. And then she straight away went into coffee farming. And because I'm a daughter of a farmer, I've been on these farms for long. I've seen the pain, I've seen the smiles. So, so when, when this message kind of came in, I'm like, okay, I think this is a great opportunity of helping myself, my family and the community. Uh, so um, when she introduced me to Angela and Angela gave me a broader perspective of what it was all about, uh, she told me that I just want to understand the pain farmers go through. It didn't even take me 15 minutes to tell you all the problems because, <laughs> because they've been part of me for long. And I, I was always asking, what can I do to help? So um, the fact that I did that small contribution, to me, I believe it is worthwhile. And uh, God willing, I believe that even if it's not funded this time, with the help from the community and the hearts in it, I believe we'll get somewhere. And um, what was your thoughts and tips of the reviews and stuff that came back from the CAs? How did you find those? Um, a lot of people were very encouraging. Um, in terms of a more a constructive feedback, there was just uh, people asking for more technical details. Um, in terms of other feedback from just the community, not necessarily in the CA role, other farmers are very, very interested in, in finding out if they can use the idea, in particular, a whole bunch of um, cannabis farmers in uh, California want to borrow the idea. <laughs> so, um, interesting. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, so what, what was their particular, um, why were they interested in it? Money, money, money. Uh, they just want to, they, they haven't seen, they, they hadn't, uh, put together how to put um, their product onto the blockchain or their systems onto the blockchain. And so they were just interested in the system um, thinking. And so with your help, Robert, there was a whole bunch of information that you gave us that we were able to go through and just rethink uh, what exactly is the production process and which part are we interested in, in going, uh, in, in attempting first. And so you were very helpful with a whole different train of thought, which was go with the middlemen because the middlemen 
are already, um, they have the background on the coffee, they have the experience buying the coffee, they have um, the, the people they sell to. <sighs> yeah. There's um, certainly one thing, you know, there's often a, a comment within the blockchain space that we're here to get rid of the middlemen. Uh, and actually what, the opportunity isn't, isn't to get rid of the middleman. It's to get rid of rent seeking. You know, the ones that people or organizations or whatever that uh, stick themselves in the middle or stick themselves in a position of power where they can extract rents for doing very, very little or providing little value. Um, so I was, yeah, when you put that focus on middlemen, I was, yeah, this is good because um, they're really actually quite an important part of a lot of supply chain related issues. Um, and the important point is to make it more transparent and accountable so that they, their opportunity for rent seeking is minimized. That's the, one of the key ideas. Um, so what was the uh, point of view though from the cannabis farmers that would be a little bit different, wasn't it? What were they coming through as? Yeah, aside, aside from um, one, one of the interesting aspects uh, with the cannabis farming is uh, well, medical marijuana and things like that, uh, which is not the same as in coffee, but has a lot to do with digital identity. Um, any thoughts on what they were asking around? It was an interesting. <laughs> I, I I came. Mm. Cannabis being legal in the states and it not being legal in other countries is a very tricky thing, uh, in terms of how I would be involved and what the. Uh, issues were in it for me. And so I didn't actually end up asking too many questions. It seemed to me that they were uh, just looking for a, a, a way in to sort of they weren't interested in the train of thought. They were just like, how do I get in? Uh, was my experience with that particular, um, ex <laughs> my experience with the experience. I'm not trying to <laughs> give too many details about exactly what happened, but I did not end up exploring the idea that deeply because I felt from past experiences with that particular person or group of people, that they weren't that serious either. So I didn't, I didn't really ask too many questions. Um, fascinating though. They, 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 they I identified uh, a way to put uh, farm products onto the blockchain. And, you know, I was also really shocked that the Georgia video only had like 60 views on YouTube and not many people were looking into it. Uh, and so it's, it's been right there the whole time, but um, I guess they saw it through this particular proposal. One of the other things too is um, when we talk about identity, most people will immediately think of the identity of um, people. But actually in reference to the Georgia wine one, is it's actually about identifying product as well. So often when we talk about getting more information to a consumer, um, traceability issues, those sort of things, what we're actually talking about there is not just identity of a person, but identity of um, the product, the end product that I might have a hold in my hand, but also the identity of those in between or those that have led to it, such as the identity of the farmers and things. So um, when we talk about 
actually an identity of a piece of uh, some coffee that I'm holding in my hand, I'm actually trying to find out its provenance, where it comes from. Um, there's a wonderful, uh, so the term, when I was talking about Māori identity, it's known more broadly as whakapapa, uh, which is kind of like a the idea of lineage, where did you come from over time? Uh, and in many respects, it's the same sort of issue when we're talking about coffee or any sort of cannabis. Where did it come from? Okay. Uh, in the case, what probably distinguishes cannabis from coffee is the point that you raised, Angela, which is um, the regulatory landscape of it is uh, much, much uh, stronger, or the requirements for it are a lot stronger, very uh, similar to. Um, say drugs, medical drugs, where did they come from? Because there's a lot of counterfeit drugs coming through. So these ideas of just looking at supply chains and applying digital identity to it, again, is quite broad. So it's interesting that um, the cannabis people reached out to you and they recognized that. Um, I was wondering, so, um, just digging in a little bit more in terms of your experience with you did the Tala Prism Pioneers program. Yeah. Perhaps you could just talk a little bit about what a Tala Prism is and uh, what the Pioneer program is. Um, did Jan or Andy do it? Are you guys in it at the moment? No? Um, I've done it, and Andy's done. Andy's done Andy. the. Um, yeah. Uh, oh, Andreas has done it, not Andy. Not, um, oh, not Andy. Okay, sorry, sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, hmm. Andreas just left. Um, yeah. So, the Atala Prism Pioneer Program is a, where we learned how to discuss all of this. What is identity? What are the ethics behind identity and how to code uh, learning how all of it works. Um, uh, it was quite an interesting experience, quite an introspective ex experience. And it's actually very interesting how you have related it back to your tribal identity. I think as a comment, that's not directly the question you asked. Um, it's a bit more tricky for me. Uh, tribally, I don't have as much confidence as you, I don't think in, in expressing that outwardly because I think I expect judgment uh, about if I'm standing for Kenya, <laughs> should I really be talking about my tribe? And so anyway, that's a different question from what you asked. Um, Kelly, what do you think? Uh, thanks, Angela. Um, so I actually have a question on uh, Atala. Um, so I have not, uh, or I didn't attend, do the pioneer program for that. So, but at some point I found myself doing some research on uh, whether Asala would support um, authentication, um, blockchain-based authentication. Is that something you'd be probably be know about in terms of a user uh, platform and they can log in by signing some data on the using a tail a tala. Uh, the yes, you could use it for that. You can use it for authentication purposes and single sign-on. Oh, nice. Yeah. Um, oh. there's there's various uh, temp, uh standardization efforts to do that. Um, so a tala prism itself is an implementation of what are known as the self-sovereign identity technology. It's coming out of the uh, W3C, the World Wide Web Consortium. There's a set of standards 
and then within that, there's a whole lot of other um, groups like the decentralized identity framework, the uh, rebooting the web of trust, the uh, trust over IP, and various other different groups. Uh, and some of those groups will be exploring how to use authentication. Uh, once you've got a control or agency over your identity, uh, then in principle, yes, you can use that for authentication purposes. Uh, why I say in principle is because it's up to a service provider to actually implement it, uh, to actually accept that as credentials. And then you've got other issues around how did that person get the credential in the first place and what does it actually mean? Okay, so there's two parts to the standard. One is the identifier, uh, which is known as DIDs, decentralized identifiers, uh, which you can generate and do anything. And the second part is something called verified credentials, which are issued by an issuer, like an education um, school or like a service um, or like a government uh, or a community group. Um, they might issue a credential that says something like, um, you can access our online website or you can gain access to a building, those sort of things. Uh, or you've passed this exam, uh, those are credentials. And they get issued to you and uh, you hold on to those and you present them to others that need to find out what's going on. So in this case here, if you're trying to sign in for authentication purposes, a service might have said, Kelly is allowed to access Gmail, let's say. Uh, and then, um, whenever you try to actually access your Gmail account, it would say, uh, Kelly, please present your uh, credential that says you're allowed to access this Gmail account. And your wallet would present it to you, uh, pre present it to that service as a verifier and they verify it uh, and then let you in if it's valid. Uh, so it definitely can be used for that sort of purpose. Nice. So, uh, uh uh, looking at it, I couldn't find, like, does it expose an API or something like that? Uh, there is an SDK for the Atala Prism stuff. I think it's still in private beta, is it? Um, those that have done the Atala Prism Pioneer program uh, have access to it. Uh, so I've got access to it. Uh, and I, you know, It's a relatively simple SDK. It's to help you make, uh, to basically publish identifiers onto, onto the Cardano blockchain, and then to make uh, credentials uh, uh, that you can do it. It doesn't fully support all the um, W3C standards at the moment, because quite a lot of them are still evolving at, at this point in time. Okay. Uh, some of the other chains like um, uh, the Sovereign chain, which is has was one of the first to actually do a lot of the digital identity work it's a special blockchain technology for digital identity uh, that has quite a lot of much wider support oh. yeah okay um so the atala yeah. prism one is to basically be able to do things on the Cardano blockchain one important thing to understand here though is it's standards based so even though you may issue a credential and create an identifier on Cardano, uh, it should be able to interact with some service for authentication purposes that uh, doesn't know anything about Cardano. That's an important criteria on that front. Yeah. Uh, I think I'll look it up a bit and find more details about the SDK. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so it's quite an important technology here in New Zealand, for example, all of our COVID vaccines were done with the SSI technology. Um, so they were deployed across the country, even though what it looked like was just a little app um, that was in your phones. It was actually issued by our public health department um, using the verified claims and SSI technology. Uh, so yeah, there'll be more and more uses of it uh, as we go forward. Yeah. Any other sort of questions around that? 
Yeah. What I would say is digital identity is a really, really big topic and can get really, really confusing fast um, because of all the different implications. I, in answering Kelly's question there, I actually touched on a huge number of concerns, uh, but I didn't actually go into them in uh, too much detail or in no detail at all in terms of things like who gets to issue a credential? What does it mean? What does the credential actually mean? And uh, who gets to verify or trust that credential? So in a simple case, for example, um, let's take an education uh, credential saying that um, I have completed this exam, this course, this paper at a tertiary institution. First of all, who's the tertiary institution? Uh, and are they entitled to issue a credential? Well, the answer is, yeah, they're entitled to issue a credential. It's up to the uh, verify, the one that is going to trust that credential, to decide whether or not it's a valid educational institution or not. All right. um, then uh, you've got to build up what are referred to as trust frameworks around this, which says who gets to issue this type of credential that I can trust. Uh, and often that's um, then hooked into some regulation and stuff, uh, which is starting to roll out more broadly across a number of countries, New Zealand being one, Australia, Canada, UK, um, are all doing what are known as trust framework bills um, that are going through which is to try and provide some uh, hard legal recourse or anchor for um, those credentials and then how they should. So there's a whole lot going through. Um, that does not mean you need to have all of those, but in the case of something like the um, SSI for coffee and the farmers and things like that, there's a big question around who gets to issue the, the credential. So have you thought about that, Angela? Those, that sort of question, what is, um, who gets to issue it? Well, it's, it's again, a complex thought, but what we're thinking about doing is working with the shareholders. The shareholders are um, the coffee, uh, the current coffee government, um, handling <laughs> institutes like the Kenya Coffee Directorate, um, the Uganda Coffee Development Authority, etc. cetera. Um, just as an in initial uh, gatherer of information, we haven't gone as far as deciding who will be the verifier or who will be um, yeah. So. And so what, what sort of challenges did you, have you seen? I'm gonna, I'm gonna grill, I'm grilling you here because I'm, I'm genuinely really, really interested about this sort of stuff, as you could probably tell. Um, and I'm not expecting you to answer all of these things, which is important to recognize that even when you're doing a proposal, um, we're dealing with lots of new ideas that people are actually new to and trying to figure out how to map these ideas into our local conditions. And if anyone stood up there and said, they know exactly how to do that, they are lying, right? Um, and so everyone's learning. And that's a key thing, I think, I believe uh, of Catalyst is we're actually trying to build this idea, a high level of uh, human potential of collaboration. But everyone's got to start from somewhere to figure out where we're going. So um, the, uh, I've actually forgotten what was the original question I asked you before I just went on that little tangent. Um, well, <laughs> um, yeah, have, have you thought about accepting who the, the verifiers are and how get, who gets to issue it as the cooperatives or those sort of things? Um, so what are, what other thoughts did you have when you were doing the proposal? I 
Well, it was such a fascinating experience because first of all, it was very last minute. And so while I'd been processing at the back, back, back of my brain, the idea of how could we bring the Georgia situation to Kenya, um, the actual processing of the idea just happened what, like 48 to 24 hours before the deadline. And so um, that's a whole experience to try and put together an idea like that, that quickly. Um, but I have been thinking about it since, since I wrote it down and The buzz in my own head was about reorganizing production. The excitement with me was about reorganizing production. And where I'd really like to get into it uh, is about how does uh, sort of the, the farming process get uh, streamlined and how does uh, a system get put in place that would actually work? Um, how would a uh, proposed coffee uh, factory, coffee drying factory or coffee processing factory, how would that work? What machines would be needed? Um, uh, what uh, certification would be needed? What drama would the Kenya government bring? <laughs> uh, so the production part of it is, is actually very interesting to me in terms of not just streamlining, but bringing a very old practice into the 21st century real quick. Uh, so <laughs> that was quite a bit of thinking has gone into that. So yeah, and, and I think so, I think even in that, I think I was, I was part of that proposal, there was um, the thinking, and I think Jackie brought it in as a problem. Um, the whole thing of longevity of the industry and the sustainability of the industry, and um, I think the concern was, could it be a dying industry because the next generation is not interested, is not that interested because they've seen their parents suffer through this whole process of trying to educate them and bring them up using coffee proceeds and the difficulty that they go through and then the pricing, um, they're at the mercy of the middlemen. So the pricing goes up and down. And um, so the question was, could these middlemen then come in to be of, of value to the farmer? So as what, as Angela is saying, it's a, it's a question of streamlining the process and bringing some transparency into that process and making that process more useful to everybody concerned along the, the chain, the supply chain. So from the producer, the farmer himself, and the, the inputs and the ground, you know, the, the ground on which that coffee is growing, um, is it being taken care of climatically or is it being damaged? And, you know, so Jackie brought up issues of soil damage as well. So there's climate, climate change issues there. Then there is the farmer themselves and the value of this very tedious and difficult task that they have gone through so many years and it's very labor intensive and difficult to do. Mm -hmm. Then the pricing and how they then, what is the value to them? So as Angela is talking about drying and, um, and uh, Jackie was also talking about how about introducing an intermediary process where the farmer is able to dry their own coffee, first of all. Um, so that that coffee now can have more value. So value addition along the chain as well. Then the identification of the people who are in the process um, of, this, of, this, of this production, um, identifying them in such a way that they know each other and each have credentials for selecting each other and each has a right to select the other so that the middleman has a right to select the farmer, the farmer has a right to select the middleman, and the middleman there in the middle is the person who finds the market, you know, because we are always talking about, it's all very well for you to produce, but where do you get the market for it? So then the farmer is somewhere in a rural, very, very deep rural area. And the market is in Mombasa. The coffee, I think the price is determined somewhere 
I'm very far away, you know. So there's a very big disconnect between where the coffee pricing is determined and the person who's producing is. So there's that whole chain is disconnected. And I think the idea of some of us maybe trying to bring some fluidity into that process and transparency and credentials and uh, trust and you know just building a lot more into that whole process so that everybody along the chain benefits maximally. That there is no big difference between, for example, you think about the cost of a coffee in Sweden and how Sweden drinks so much coffee. And then when you think how much of that translates to the farmer, you know, the amount of money they'll pay $3 for a coffee, but the farmer gets almost nothing, it's a pittance. So uh, how do you build that balance? So the idea that you can have something produced and ends up in a cup, giving somebody like Robert great pleasure and ability to sit here and listen to us after midnight because he had that coffee. You know, so what is the link between Robert and Jackie? Because Robert is sitting here in New Zealand in a rich country, drinking very expensive coffee. And Jackie is there walking barefoot because she doesn't have money for shoes. So what's, what's the, how do you build this whole thing? So I think it's, as Angela is saying, it's a very big thought. It's a very big idea and it's very problematic and has had many issues. But at the same time, it's been thought through a lot and there is a lot of information and knowledge concerning that whole process, because it's old in Kenya, it's a very old trade. So I'm sure there is quite a lot of also data that exists that can be captured and gathered and put even on the blockchain, you know? Yeah, so I, that's yeah. how I feel. I feel like it's a very big thought, it's a big idea. It is, and, and that, um, so from the process, even though you sort of said, Angela, that you know it was rushed like 48 hours or whatever, to write the proposal. We'd had a conversation in the town hall about this and I worked through it and uh, discussion. And um, so what I found is just working on these proposals, regardless of whether they get funded or not, is actually kind of a, a great way to make you think about a problem, which then starts to seed or generate a whole lot of other thoughts around where it could go, how you could tackle it and things. Because Anne, we've had this discussion around supply chain certification um, and the issues around that generally and the corruption within Ken in Kenya and how do you address it? And some of these really big systematic problems and yeah, they're massive problems, but where do you start? And this is, one of the things I liked about your proposal, Angela, was that you weren't trying to solve the big problem all out of catching out of the door, but actually you found something that it was quite meaningful. Just let's just try and get something like give them digital identity uh, that can help them build up some sort of reputation to begin with, in this case, the middlemen. So they identify the, the middlemen that went rent seekers is the way I sort of read it. And uh, that was, I thought was really valuable. So uh, that's what I'm hearing coming through. Um, Jackie, did that help you in terms of helping to work on this or talk it with, with Angela? Did that help you do a little bit of mapping at all in terms of from your own experience, your personal experience into what uh, one catalyst is and what say a blockchain is? Pardon me, Robert? I was just wondering if in terms of trying to, even just in the discussion with Angela around this, um, did it help you uh, try and understand what Catalyst and, and potentially what a blockchain is a little bit more? Yeah, what I've got is a, a blockchain is about um, the security and openness, basically for tracking through if it's a product you need to track through to understand who is behind this how was it produced uh, how who handled it to to that level so that 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 uh, transparency and the transactions that go through is what i've picked is what yeah. we are trying to achieve here not so cool um andy oh yeah okay I, uh, i'm gonna ask you a question andy um uh, 
later on. But Jan, go. I'd like to try to address uh, Anne's questions. Uh, so Anne asked, how do we get the beans from uh, Jackie's place all the way to Robert? Uh, perhaps uh, uh, the answer, perhaps, is, uh, the answer could be creating a narrative. So like Starbucks, uh, how, how they can uh, sell it uh, that much, that expensive is because they create this, this narrative that Starbucks is cool, that Starbucks is the best coffee. Well, in actuality, it's not. And how does this tie in into blockchain is uh, the, te the traceability aspect, because uh, this is something that, uh, that I see is slowly growing in the European countries. Uh, to, to my understanding that they're interested of where does my money go to? So when we have that tech, the traceability uh, capability of like having a barcode on, uh, on the drinks of a cafe in New Zealand where when someone scans that barcode and, and they, they can see that it, it's this farmer from Africa uh, who lives here, who has a family of five, uh, where his uh, where their living conditions are like this, I think that will make um, uh, selling beans. Um, no, no, not selling beans. Uh, penetrating the market more easier uh, than having go through these layers of middlemen, because you have this direct connection between the producer. And the buyer, where where people can see uh, 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 who the farmers are, and it's uh, it's a coincidence. I just uh, that you mentioned uh, Andy Robert because Andy is also in uh, in Margo, and uh, in Margo they have a, a traceability product, and perhaps uh, uh, Andy's uh, experience uh, with because in Indonesia there in Margo is uh, they have a, a cooperation with a. a coffee farmers in uh in sumatra and perhaps andy could uh, share more about that you answered my you asked my question Jan, of andy <laughs> <laughs> right so yeah uh, i get uh, the, the i guess i think it's the time for me to answer then <laughs> probably right so uh the way that uh, when I, I, I didn't follow all the uh, uh, conversation from the beginning, but the, 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 the one that I got is actually, I, I, I might want to uh, uh, tell a little bit on the coffee, uh, what we are doing here in Indonesia, what we call it a uh, blue corinji. So uh, basically it, it's all about the traceability, just like uh, Robert said. So uh, if you want to hear about that, it's uh, basically, uh, by doing a blockchain, by putting your data in blockchain, then people can access it. Uh, just like Jackie said, it's about the openness about information, right? So people can access everything what's uh, in the uh, a blockchain, right? So uh, the way that it works is actually that uh, people can know if they drink a product, uh, a coffee, coffee product or coffee beans, so they can uh, get it from their uh, uh, a packaging, there's a QR code there that they can scan and then they can put there, uh, they can see on the application, they can see uh, where this uh, coffee bean comes from, right? So uh, from, uh, yeah, from the, the shop and then it goes from the distributor, it goes to the, uh, 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 what we call here, Koprasi, it's kind, what do you call Koprasi in there, uh, Jan? <laughs> Help me here. It's like a, a group of, uh, 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 yeah, a group of uh, community a, community union. Yeah, let's say uh, let's call it like that, right? So basically, uh, all the farmers go this to the cooperative, and then the cooperative will goes on uh, to the produ producer. I mean, like uh, the one who uh, make the uh, roasting and everything, right? So everything is open on that, right? So. Uh, what people get interested in is actually if you say that, let's say here in Indonesia, we, we got a lot of uh, areas producing coffee. Coffee from Sumatra is different from coffee from uh, uh, Bali, coffee from uh, what else? Uh, yeah, 
uh, uh, different parts of Indonesia. It all has a different taste, right? Different characteristic. And then for the people uh, understand that, people who love coffee, it's very valuable. So uh, it is some, a matter of whether you want just, just, just to trust the label on the packaging, or you want to know, is it real? Let's say, for example, if I say it's a copy from Bali, but uh, do you know, is it authentic uh, copy coming from Bali? Or is it actually coming from the other parts of the uh, region, right? So what we uh, put in the blockchain is actually all those information. So every time uh, people, uh, a farmer is uh, working on uh, his, uh, let's say his uh, uh, farm and then producing anything, then uh, he goes to this uh, cooperative, this uh, uh, union, and then it will be, uh, let's say, it will be uh, put into records there, into the blockchain, right? So uh, you know exactly that, hey, it's got recorded on that place, right? And then you know that the blockchain uh, is actually uh, immutable, that whatever you record in the blockchain, it's immutable. You can change it once you record it there. So those kind of records, for every, uh, let's say, every, every uh, hope, every, every transfer of, from the farmer to this union, to the producer, to the distributor, to the shop, you can get this all recorded. And then people know that, oh, it's really coming from that place that I want to. For example, I like to copy from Bali. Then I just uh, see on the label, hey, it's a copy from Bali. Uh, coffee from Bali, but is it real coffee from Bali? Then I can uh, scan on the uh, application and then I can see it. Oh, it's really coming from Bali. So that's what uh, valuable is, right? So if we, you say that, uh, just like Anne said here, for example, uh, hey, how do you connect a robot here? It's a coffee uh, aficionado. <laughs> and then uh, the farmer from uh, uh, Africa. So how do you connect that? through the data, so the, the data that is already uh, uh, recorded every time the coffee moves places, right? So people can see, oh, this is really coffee from there, right? So uh, uh, that's what is happening with the Blue Corinchi. It's a traceability product from Imargo. Uh, yeah, that's basically it. So uh, just put all the records when the coffee moves from one place to the other, and put this on the record, and then people can access that record, and that's it. Right. So that's the 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 basically the traceability. You you know where it comes from. So I guess that's how I should explain it, Robert. Yeah. What I'm curious about is um, the the structure of the coffee. Um, industry in mm -hmm. Indonesia versus say what Jackie sort of brought Jackie and Angela brought up around uh, issues of coffee farming in their region is that the small lots as I understand it small lot farmers rurally based um, a lot of them older so the knowledge is starting to um, uh, die off in a sense because the young ones don't want to grow coffee anymore. How similar to that is the same? What sort of um, what's the structure of the coffee industry in Indonesia uh, compared to say what's happening in East Africa? Okay, well, uh, I guess what from what I understand is actually it's a uh, uh, the coffee or actually wine or a uh, 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 grape wine, right? It's uh, different, it will taste different based on the structure of the land itself, right? So that's what make it uh, special. So for example, we have uh, different islands in Indonesia and then we have uh, the one in Sumatra, the one in Bali, the one in uh, Java, it's all different. It will uh, bring up a different taste on that. 
So based on that, so if you say the, the, the structure is actually, basically all are farmers, right? And the farmers have their own patch of lands where they grow their own coffee. So they make this kind of a union where they uh, put together because they just want to uh, uh, farm the coffee. They, they want to focus on the growth of the coffee. They don't want to uh, focus on the uh, uh, sales, right? So make, they make this uh, kind of union. So they have a small patches of plants and then they sell it to the union, right? Then the union will sell it to the producer and it goes on and goes on, right? So um, I guess that's, uh, if, if you say that, um, that might, be valuable for uh, the farmers in Africa. It's actually that you can make uh, those kind of uh, uh, groups of uh, farmers going on to the union, and then they can put, yeah, they, they, they have uh, more power in that uh, group. Yes, Jan. Just to add to Andy, uh, it's as Andy has explained, uh, uh, in a farmer level, it's similar to Africa. But what I would like to share to Anne and Jackie is, heck no, those, those, those young kids, they should be really pumped up about coffee because in Indonesia, coffee is really a hot commodity. Just for your info, I'm gonna share a, 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 a link to everyone here. Okay, so there's a, a startup. It's a startup, okay, it's not a, make, it's not a big company. It was a startup. It started up, it, it slowly growed, and eventually it became a unicorn. Can you guys imagine that? A unicorn that sells coffee. That's crazy. A, a startup coffee that becomes a unicorn. And I believe that is something that is also possible in Africa. So perhaps uh, when, when uh, if you Anne and Jackie, you guys like you are uh, having trouble on how do I get these younglings, uh, younglings uh, pumped up? Perhaps you can share this, share this uh, uh, article that, hey, over in Indonesia, as Andy has mentioned, where the farmers are in the same boat, someone had this crazy idea to create a narrative. I don't know how they did it, but, I, but they did it. They, they beat Starbucks, they beat every single established Western coffee in Indonesia and became a unicorn. To me, that's still, I'm still amazed by that. Yeah, Starbucks was a, uni was a unicorn too. It was a startup at one point out in Seattle. Um, so absolutely, and, and you're seeing, seeing the same sort of thing within China as well. I just wanted to touch on one thing before we close up because we'll be going over two hours now. Um, but to go back to the point that Jan made about stories and um, that actually it is really, it's not just stories, it's actually verifiable stories. Because one of the big problems that Western consumers have is that effectively marketing is the profession of convincing you to believe in one particular story. And it's not always true. <laughs> so we get things like uh, greenwashing, for example. Yeah, we're, we're great, we pay out, we do fair trade, those sort of things. Um, as a consumer, you become incredibly wary of any sort of statements being made by companies or whatever, because everyone wants to make their product look great. So one of the things here is, if you combine the two things that Andy was saying and Jan was saying, you've got uh, the actual records of transactions that occur that can be verified and summarized, but um, to make consumers care and things like that is through uh, the narrative, that they can actually trust that narrative. And I, th I think I raised, uh, there's a company here called Flight Coffee, uh, which does go to great extents to actually um, do tell, tell that actual narrative uh, that's going through. And if I could multitask, which I can't do very well at all, I'd find a photo of when I was last there, which shows both the different types of coffee 
a little story about where they came from, the farmer that's made it, and a QR code that lets me go in and find the narrative. But what I would like to see is also, when I scan it with my phone, I get a nice green tick that says, yes, this has been verified. And that, you know, the, the company that I'm buying the coffee from hasn't doctored it. It's actually legitimate because it came from over there. Um, now, one of the early, one of the, my most favorite writings of Nick Sarbos. Does anyone, everyone know who Nick Sarbos is? Anyone come across that name before? Uh, Smart Contract? Yeah, he's Mr. Smart Contract guy for, um, and uh, Nick Sarbos wrote a paper in the mid nineties called Video Contracts. And that's what made me, when Jan was talking about something, um, I'll see if I can find it. Um, it's one of his early ones. Anyway, he wrote a um, paper in his usual sort of style, which was really discussing what contracts were and the fact that you could create for a lot of um, uh, farmers and other related um, throughout Africa and East Asia and stuff, that they may, may be illiterate. Um, may not be great at reading and that sort of thing or understand stuff, but they can understand the other person when they're talking. So the idea behind video contracts was to tell their story as in, yes, I'm agreeing to this uh, environment this sort of way. And this was one type of contract. So Nick had done that. Uh, he wrote that about 94 or 95, I think. Um, and I was always taken by that particular uh, paper that he wrote as a way to combine the two. So there's there's a, sort of a, a thread of information or way uh, of joining those things together. Narrative is really important. But can you actually also narrative that's recorded of the history of each of the transactions that's recorded on the blockchain, bring the two together as some sort of notional video contract. Um, one last question before we disappear. You get funded, Angela. What then? Well, I'll be surprised. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I'll have to figure it out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's right. That's the energy. We'll figure it out. Um, and and Andy, the. Um, to what extent has the tra your traceability solution from Emergo, to what extent has that gone to incorporate digital identity and things like Hatala Prism? Oh, uh, for the traceability, it doesn't have to, anything to do with uh, Atala Prism, actually. So it's basically just uh, gave you the uh, traceability and it doesn't give you any identity or, at all. So traceability just gives you uh, uh, because uh, it, 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 it's uh, Atala Prism is actually we are be building the infrastructure of uh, uh, showing people and then what they have, right? And people can uh, show other people not the whole info about them, but granular granular items, right? For example, if you want to just uh, say, uh, I, you want to know my name, I give you my name. You want to know about my education, I give you data for the education. And those kind of things, right? So uh, traceability doesn't do anything about that. Well, you might want to uh, combine that, uh, but yeah, it's a long uh, 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 story. Then it's another story. But uh, with without that, it's actually possible to do the traceability. Just uh, yeah, basically just uh, uh, save your data and then make sure that everyone can uh, access your data somehow. Mm -hmm. So there's an opportunity to bring the two together digital identity and traceability. Uh, sure, sure. Work it, right. <laughs> working across Indonesia and uh, East Africa would be a great way to do things. So there we are. So yeah. any other questions or anything before we wrap up uh, uh, this, this round of uh, number 25, 26 of the Eastern Town Hall? And as we get ready for the results to come in, and uh, then take a breather for two weeks, chill and think about 
the the results and whether or not to refine a proposal if it didn't get funded or anything else like that. Any other last questions? Any last thoughts? Yeah, I'm still wide awake for a change. <laughs> I shouldn't have. A, I shouldn't have. Got to a... cut you off. <laughs> yeah, uh, I shouldn't have had the the quad quad espresso at uh, four o'clock <laughs> in the afternoon. Uh, but hey, okay. With that, everyone, I'm going to uh, call it a, a close for tonight or today. And it's lovely seeing you all. And I hope you got something out of that uh, little discussion. And things. Thank you. Ka kite. Ka kite Thank you. Bye, everyone. Thanks. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Okay.